When we look at the map, it starts to tell us stories. When I was a child, I could only wonder about the details behind these stories. Now that we have the internet, there's no excuse for not knowing about that which makes us curious. Today's story, Who Killed the Aral Sea? The easy answer is the Soviet Union, and they did it for cotton. But like with everything in life, the easy answer is neither totally correct nor satisfying. So let's look at the bigger story. First of all, what is the Aral Sea? It depends on what time period you want to ask that question. If we go back to 1960, we would say that the Aral Sea was the fourth largest inland body of water in the world by area. Now, it was never a very deep body of water because at that time it was the twelfth largest body of water by volume. Still very big, but keep in mind that compared to many other lakes, it's really quite shallow. There's another thing to say. Even though it's usually called the Aral Sea, it's more properly defined as a lake because it's not so salty. In 1960, now that it has largely evaporated and dried up, it's extremely salty, three to four times more so than the ocean. At levels as of 2014, the North Lake would rank somewhere around 50th in the world in terms of area, and the South Lake even less. The Aral Sea is located in between Kazakhstan, which is in the north, and Uzbekistan, in the south. Both of these nations were former Soviet republics. So, in the 1960s, the Soviet Union Central Agricultural Planning Committees had total control over the area, including the two major rivers which feed this lake. The central planners decided in one of their five-year meetings that cotton production in the Uzbekistan area should be a focus. Despite the concern of one of the scientists present at a 1964 meeting that the lake would dry up as a result of these policies, it continued. This scientist described the mood as for the sake of cotton, the lake may suffer. And indeed it has. We saw evidence in October 2014 from a NASA satellite image that the southeastern part of the lake has completely turned into a desert. It dried up completely for the first time in recent memory. The decisions made by the Soviet government which affected people who were largely not ethnically Russian, have had devastating consequences on the region. However, we have to say that this area was decolonized, or broke away from the Soviet Union, almost 25 years ago. So they have had a chance for economic and political independence. Yet, the drawing of the lake particularly in the South, has intensified since then. So is it appropriate to completely blame the Soviets? Once historical motions go into action, they are very hard to reverse. The Uzbek economy has become very dependent on agriculture, and in particular, cotton. And the current government, which is a repressive monoparty state, has not shown any willingness to decrease cotton production, as Uzbekistan is in the top five of global producers. The destruction by a colonizing power on a small state's environment is one of the many complicated factors the world must face when thinking about environmental catastrophe. 
The situation of the Aral Sea is extreme, but it is representative of other problems which the world is facing and will face as climate change and overpopulation and other factors become realities for more and more people. So let's look at some more of the factors involved in the killing of the Aral Sea. While it's easy to blame the Russian or Uzbek government for this problem, we have to also look in a more nuanced way in how the environment responds to one initial condition. The planners of these states surely didn't intend for the lake to completely dry up, but it's hard to predict when certain feedback loops will cross a point of no return. One example is when the lake becomes shallow enough that evaporation is out of control. As the lake becomes more shallow, it becomes hotter. As it becomes hotter, it evaporates more and becomes even more shallow. There's also a problem of uneven depths. The east is quite shallow while the west is very deep. As salinity increases, it will tend to settle towards the deeper part. And this creates a situation where the deep, heavy water remains cold and doesn't mix with the light, shallow water, which is warmer, again, increasing evaporation. With less surface area, there are fewer clouds, meaning less precipitation, and more and more dependence on the flow from rivers, which themselves are dependent on glacier melt. As climate change intensifies and surface areas of glaciers go down, the amount of water in the rivers is going down as well. There is now a big desert, it's called the Aral Desert now, where the lake used to be, which creates major dust storms, which negatively affect crops, which make a cycle where farmers need more fertilizer and more agrochemicals, which run into the rivers and cause the remaining parts of the Aral Sea to become more and more polluted, which kill more and more of the fish and make more and more pollution and disease for the people living there. One light of hope is that as far back as 1992, the five countries whose major watersheds drain into the Aral Basin, which are Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Kyrgyzstan. They will commit 1% of their GDP to restoring the lake. Ironically, since the fall of the Soviet Union, it may actually be harder to come to an agreement about how to facilitate the recovery because there are five or six countries who have major watersheds which drain into the sea. This means negotiations with six different heads of state who have six different ambitions. Kazakhstan, the largest of the six countries having the most resources to do something about it, has become protective. They have erected a dam which has brought back lots of the water and indeed part of the commercial fishing industry and parts of their towns along the edge of the lake are starting to get some economic revival. However, damming it means less potential flow going into the south, which would help Uzbekistan. The problem is, Kazakhstan believes, perhaps rightly so, that Uzbekistan will not give up its cotton industry and therefore not allow the river to refill that desert basin. So Kazakhstan doesn't have a lot of reason to let the dam flow into the south. As bad as this is, there's no reason to give up because this has happened before because of events triggered by humans. The idea that humans have only recently started to change the world's climate and landscape is again and again proven false. Pre-Islamic Persians 
who moved into the area in the 4 and 500s AD actually diverted the rivers for farming and led to the destruction of the south part of the Aral Sea. It happened again when the Mongols invaded under Timur in the 1300s. Similar story, the southern part of the Aral Sea was destroyed. After the power of these destructive political forces died down, the lake made a recovery. So even though only saltwater brine shrimp are surviving in the small eastern slice of the southern part of the sea, if water was reintroduced there, it's expected that fish will return. Nature is incredibly resilient if we help it. While it might be comfortable psychologically to just say that the Soviet agricultural system killed the Aral Sea. If we're really looking for solutions, we have to think more deeply and in a complicated fashion to assess the situation. It's political, it's environmental, and it's social. The type of problems involving political organization, management of water resources between different nationalities, countries, between different areas with interests involving mountains, valleys, agriculture, electricity, must be balanced in places all over the world. It's something that, unfortunately, Central Asia has not been able to deal with, and time will tell whether other areas will do any better.